Welcome to Beyond Justice, a RISE critical conversation on sport, race, and community police relations. I'm your host, Monica McNutt, basketball analyst for ESPN and MSG. RISE is a national nonprofit educating and empowering the sports community to eliminate racial discrimination, champion social justice, and improve race relations. With a heightened national focus on systemic racism and policing, RISE launched its Beyond Justice Critical Conversation series earlier this year to provide actionable steps for achieving racial equity and social justice for improving relations between law enforcement and communities of color. RISE is leading conversations in key cities across the country to rally the sports community and Americans everywhere to be effective change agents. Today, we're in New York City and featuring leaders from across the Big East Conference. Joining us is Tracy Ellis Ward, Big East Senior Associate Commissioner for Women's Basketball and, Conf and the conference's Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, Mike Anderson, Head Coach of St. John's Men's Basketball, Miles Cow, a fifth year senior on Seton, Hall, Seton Hall's excuse me, men's basketball team, and Dr. Andrew McIntosh, RISE's Chief Program Officer. I am so excited to get started. And I think a great place for us to do this is to talk about some of your personal experiences in dealing with these issues. This question goes to all of you. I'd like you to share a little bit of your own experiences with racism and how witnessing acts of police violence, as we all have over the last year, particularly during the course of the 2020 uh, summer, contribute to emotional and psychological, the emotional and psychological toll, excuse me, of racism. And so let's start with Tracy. We'll go Coach Anderson, Miles, and then Dr. McIntosh. Thank you, Monica. It's um, happy to be here today. And thank you, Rise, for organizing this um, amazing panel and this discussion. I think it's very important and needed uh, in today's culture and to continue these dialogues. Um, first off, for me, when I kind of think about um, experiencing racism, I have to go back to my childhood. Um, I first experienced racism uh, in elementary school and then again in high school um, and went on to experience it, obviously, in my adult life. Um, in the workplace and in various other settings. And um, even as I reflect upon it, um, I've had experienced it from a parent's lens. Um, I have two children, um, a daughter and a son. And so just having to uh, look at it through the lens of being a mother uh, and having to uh, educate her children in a way uh, that perhaps uh, non-majority folks don't have to uh, in terms of how you're supposed to move and behave in the world. So. Um, it does have an impact uh, in, in this police violence you know, over the past year and a half that's been amplified in the media has really, in my opinion, um, contributed to a lot of emotional trauma uh, that pe people are experiencing. And when you talk about trauma, it, it comes at three levels. And, and when I talk about police violence, it's a chronic trauma because it's uh, reoccurring and it's uh, something that you see and hear often in the media. And so it does uh, cause some, some mental angst uh, and it impacts your mental health, it impacts our judgment, it impacts your sleep, um, and just really your, your way of being and your overall well being. So it does indeed take a toll, uh, this form of racism and how it manifests itself uh, for us in the workplace, uh, but most of all for our children uh, coming up. Hmm. Thank you, Tracy. That was such a thorough answer. Coach Anderson. Well, you know, obviously, uh, uh, Appreciate you know being invited on this panel, and uh, obviously with all the events that have taken place in the last year and a half, uh, we're getting to the point where we can you know get uncomfortable to get comfortable, and in, uh, in terms of talking about this here, and you know I'm, I go back to my childhood. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, and we all know there was a lot of civil unrest that took place there. So growing up as a kid, you know, obviously it's imprinted in your mind. You know, your parents, they try to buffer you from some of that stuff that took place. Uh, but, you know, I'm from a family of eight kids. Uh, we live like in a, a two bedroom shotgun house, three room shotgun house, you know, is the front room for mom and dad, uh, eight kids in the middle room, and then there's the kitchen. And so uh, when, when I say we're buffered, you know, we live in that community where it's a black community and things of nature, but it always was a mindset. You don't want to get stopped by the police because it ain't just to get arrested, you might get killed. And to, to be honest with you, 
when I'm about six years old, uh, they actually, the police, the white police officer came to our house looking for our dad. I mean, it was, and you can imagine a six year old kid at that time. And so as I've grown, so we talk about the racism that took place, obviously uh, there was a lot of fear, especially down in, in, the, in the Southern part uh, of the country in Birmingham, where we talk about civil rights and all those things took place. But even as I've had a chance to move on, you know, I got a chance to go to Arkansas, I was in Oklahoma, and of course, uh, now I'm, I'm in New York. Uh, but the thing about it is that that stays in your mind. So when you talk about psychologically and things of that nature, what has taken place here in the last year and a half, I tell you, it just brings out a lot of things that, that, that have taken place. And so, and even as I'm in, in Arkansas, I can recall being the head coach there, you know, uh, uh, and, and let me, let me go back. You know, I played for a hall of fame coach in Nolan Richardson, and he was the first black in the state of Arkansas, in the state of Oklahoma, to be at a majority white institution, a head coach. You can imagine the things that he went through. Went to Arkansas, the same thing. And I'm sitting right there and I'm seeing all the things that are coming at him, uh, even with our players. I mean, they're treated a different way than, uh, let's say, the, 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 the football players, you know, at, at Arkansas. So I'm on the front line of seeing all those things. And uh, it's a funny thing that happened to me when I went back to Arkansas as a head coach. Uh, I'm pulling out of a restaurant and uh, I'm, I'm taking a left turn to, to go out into the street, the main street. And I kind of swear him not to, to hit hit a car or something like that. Well, this cop, this young cop stops me. It's, it's late at night. You gotta remember now, I'm the head coach at the University of Arkansas. My wife's in the car with me and he pulls me over and, you know, uh, first, you know, ID and things of that nature. Ask my wife for ID. She's sitting over on the other side. I said, no, that ain't necessary there. It's a young guy. And I think he thought I had been drinking and things of that nature, the, ball, the car swerved. And this kid's got to be like 25 years old. And I'm the head coach at Arkansas. Well, his partner comes up and he recognized who I am. And all of a sudden, boom, it, the conversation changes all of a sudden now. Coach was sorry with, with this and that, you know, and, and I, you know, of course I was offended, my wife was offended. And, uh, but we're, we're, we're not talking about many years ago. And so, so I say that is that just think, I'm in that position as the head coach. What if I'm not the head coach? And that's what we see all the time. We see our young men, uh, they're stopped and, and it goes beyond that because then you're being provoked. So, uh, uh, so, so again, there's still a lot of systemic racism things that take place and, but I'm glad we're having this conversation to, uh, but those, those are some of my experiences and, uh, and I keep experiencing each and every day. Yeah, the living and, and, and ongoing experience yes. of being a black yes. man in America. Miles, I, I want to hear what comes to mind when this topic is brought up for you, as you are the youngest of the panel, but your experience literally has been amplified in ways that we had not seen since arguably the height of the civil rights movement back in the day. Yeah, um, I would like to thank you, Monica, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, I would like to thank Rise for having us putting this great uh, panel discussion with these great play with these great people. So I'm blessed to be in this position. But um, yeah, um, growing up, I mean, I'm from Middletown, Delaware. My dad, he, he's been a cop his whole life since I've been growing up. And um, my mom, she's been a school principal. So growing up, they've made sure like, I had like a, a good head on my shoulders and I was staying out of trouble. I knew what to do um, if a police officer had approached me and you know, all those good things when I was growing up. So I didn't really have too much problems growing up. Like the only things that I had to go through as a, as a child, well, as a younger younger person, um, would be like the prejudge and the people looking at me and like trying to put something on me before even talking to me. So they see me in the store with my mask on and they automatically think I'm something else. So like those looks the look like they look at me they'll stare at me and those those give me funny looks so those funny looks that they'll give like and then like i've seen a lot i haven't experienced a lot but i've seen a lot of racism and um and my friend's been going through it like my dad my friend my best friend from delaware 
he's actually been pulled over by a cop and he said like the cops were way too aggressive pulled him out the car and was like trying to tackle him trying to wrestle him and you know he wasn't he wasn't comfortable at all and he felt like, like the cop was just doing a lot at that time so but personally i haven't experienced a lot of racism acts against me but i the only thing that i've went through is like the the crazy looks or the prejudge that people give me and they think i'm like you know a, a crazy thug or but i'm none of that like little do they know if they talk to me and help hold a conversation with me i'm a seton hall basketball player i graduated i'm doing all these good things so they they don't like it's just the prejudge that i have to go through yeah Thank you for sharing that, Miles. Um, Andrew, we're going to push the conversation forward a bit. And last month, Juneteenth has been acknowledged as a federal holiday. And while that is an important stepping stone in terms of the conversation of our American history, what lessons from Juneteenth can we take and look at when we address the issues of racism and bias in policing and how we can improve that relationship between the community and law enforcement moving forward? Yeah, thanks a lot, Monica. And I want to thank all the panelists again for, for joining us. I'm really excited about this conversation. And I think that's that's such a, an excellent question because as we do the work to move our country forward, we have to look to history. Um, I know a lot of folks would say, let's forget our history, just kind of take stock of the present moment and move forward. But the moment we are in has been created by our history. Um, the legacy of, of slavery and the legacy of oppression in this country, unfortunately, has impacted the trajectories of folks. Um, and so we have to take stock of that and account of that as we move forward. Um, Juneteenth, for us at RISE, is, is a really momentous occasion. We, we're happy that it is now a federal holiday because it represents, I think, two things. One, it, it represents, first of all, um, you know, slaves finally, Black people in this country finally being recognized as, as free. Um, and I think that is a really important, uh, a really momentous thing. Um, you know, President Lincoln obviously signed this in, 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 into law. Um, and, and that I think is important, right? Like here is a defining moment where all Americans in this country are supposed to be legally free. Um, so I think that's the first piece of Juneteenth that I think we need to and ought to recognize and celebrate. But if the second piece I think is, is equally as important, which is, you know, post-1865, you know, it, it took obviously two years before all, all of these slaves got the news um, at Galveston. Um, and even post that, there was still a, a number of Jim Crow laws um, in effect and a, a lot of pushback against some of the liberties that Black people and people of color were supposed to be afforded in this country. Um, and I think the second big thing for us at Rise is that we understand, therefore, that this movement is a struggle, right? Um, you know, Dr. King said, you know, it's it's a long arc. It, it it moves towards justice, but but it is a long arc. And so we have to be active. We have to to be vigilant. We have to have conversations like these. We need great leaders, um, like those at the Big East, Coach Anderson, Miles, Tracy, and others, um, to continue doing this work and making sure that we are aware um, of what has taken place historically. We've made great strides. Um, as a nation and as a country, and uh, we need to continue making those strides. Um, that moment, that gap between President Lincoln signing the proclamation um, and the slaves finally getting that news at Galveston, um, er eroded trust, right? Um, and so I think when we think about policing today, um, there are some echoes in that, you know, can we trust the institutions of the state? Um, in what, under what circumstances can we trust them? We recognize that we need to work with them and alongside them, but, but, but how do we trust them? When do we trust them? Um, and what is due to citizens um, as we move um, our communities forward? And so, again, I think this is an important conversation and one that needs to be had across the country. Um, really commend the Big East um, for the work that they've done over the last year and a half with us uh, and to continue having these types of conversations. Thank you, Andrew. That was such a thoughtful answer um, in terms of the trust. And we're definitely seeing the residue of that lack of trust throughout our society. Miles, I want to come back to you because you mentioned that your father 
um, is a member of the law enforcement community. And we have examples of programs that are designed to bridge the gap between communities of color and law enforcement. For example, RISE and the NBA have their Building Bridges Through Basketball program that does just that, engages law enforcement with youth using sports to create an open dialogue um, around education and of course playing basketball, looking to break barriers and change, ex change perceptions, excuse me. I know you personally created a foundation in your community in Delaware called Cal Cares, which has similar goals. Tell us about the work that you're doing and why it is so appropriate to bridging the gaps. Uh, yeah, Cal Cares, it's a non-profitable organization that me and my mom put together and we, we just thought it was a good idea to help the um, youth in the black community and my black community where I'm from to bridge that, that relationship with police officers around. So basically we, um, last like a couple of years ago before COVID, we've, um, we went to police, police um, courtrooms and like we visited the jail and we were just talking to a lot of cops and we we're just trying to get on their good side and just making social and we're just socializing like normal people and that's what we wanted to really show the kids that cops are normal people too like every cop is not a, a bad cop so that's what we're just trying to like get these get that through their head and you know i'm looking forward to doing another kale cares event but you know f from all the things with covid and all the restrictions that i had to go through i couldn't really get one off this last past year but we're looking forward to picking back up well, we certainly commend that work, Miles, and, and I'm hopeful that you can pick it back up too. I wanna to take this next question to both Tracy and Mike in positions of leadership. What concrete changes do you all feel are required to make policing more fair and equitable um, and to create conditions where people of color feel safer when engaging in law enforcement? And Tracy, I'll go to you first. Uh, thanks, Monica. You know, in a short amount of time, I mean, that this is a whole panel in itself, that question, right? Um, so I think, it, you know, there's a few things and you know there's a lot of information out there right now and there's a lot of cry or decry or however you want to call it about defunding the police and I think that there's a misnomer around what that concept means. Um, ideally folks are talking about really kind of reallocating resources uh, in places to actually mitigate some of the systemic issues that are causing some of the crime to exist in certain communities right. Um, so I think there's also an onus to to educate officers and uh, to, to dovetail on what Miles is doing in his community, having conversations uh, with the police and trying to bridge the gaps with community members is very important. Um, you know, some of these policemen don't necessarily live in the community, so they don't understand the cultural differences that might exist. Um, you know, there's lots of policies that still exist around our country, you know, the stop and frisk, um, the, the criminalization of, you know, small drug possessions and just so many things that have been going on and on for decades that have kind of led us to this place that we're at right now. So I think the real uh, starting point is just reflecting on the things that have led us to where we are and figuring out how to do it better and differently because clearly what's been happening hasn't worked. And so to recognize that and be willing to uh, dismantle it or uh, adjust, make adjustments so that people um, of all races and creeds are in the system. And, you know, clearly that hasn't been happening. Well said. Coach, I know you shared very personal experience interacting with police, both as a young child and as an adult. Well, it, it's so interesting that, 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 that Miles, he talks about, you know, uh, his foundation, what he was, he was doing his program. I'm one of those kids that, that benefit from that. We used to have back in Birmingham, they had, used to have what they call the PAT, Police Athletic Teams. And we were in, you know, and that was a way of actually the officers immersing themselves into the community. And I'm talking about from basketball to uh, football, I mean, you know, baseball. And so we were around that. And so I learned not to be a, a afraid of police, but it was mostly the black police that, that, that actually kind of ran that. Uh, but I'm a product of that. And, and, and why I say that, because as we talk about trying to get solutions, I think what you're doing is, is awesome. And I think we gotta do more of that. But at the same time, there's gotta be transparencies. I think it's gotta be transparent. Uh, what, what, you know, when, when you think about officers, you know, why they become officers? You know, some of the agendas, you know, it ain't what, what it probably should be intended for. You know, some of them have agendas that are beyond that, you know, they're, 
uh, they, they probably got some ideological things that are going on in their mind. And guess what? They're there for a reason to probably try to suppress and oppress us, you know, as, as a black community. Uh, but with that being said, I just think the dialogue, the conversations have to continue to be uncomfortable, to be comfortable. What is taking place is now all the things that have taken place. I know back in the days when my parents were growing up and I was growing up with social media, now you see everything. And I think that's what took place. It, it, it hit some people. I, I had a, uh, a white friend of mine uh, who helped raise my kids. Our kids were raised together. And she called me uh, no more than probably about three months ago. And she, and she still lives in the same neighborhood I lived in in Arkansas. And she said, all these young people, these young black people who have moved into my neighborhood and, uh, and they're just so disrespectful. I'm walking my dog, they're disrespectful. Old lady, old white lady, get out of here. And the first thing she said, you, know, you don't know me. My best friend is black, you know? Obviously for most people, that's like, ooh. But she was being truthful. She was talking about me, which it is. And they didn't understand her because like I said, she helped raise my kids. And so, so when you talk about education, I'm not talking about just educating, you know, uh, I'm talking about educating the young people too, as well. And uh, but I, but I think the, the key is is uh, there's got to be you know the town halls we talk about doing. There's some things that have been in place that are going on. Uh, but I think education is a big part of it. And I'm talking about from the cops, you know, learn a, bit, a little bit more about about us as people. Uh, you know, uh, coming out coming our neighborhood. You know, there are some officers that I've seen, uh, a guy in a little uh, officer norm. This guy here is a rock star. I mean, he goes into the community. He helps them plant their gardens. I mean, he he he, he does so many things with, with, with that community. I mean, he was like one of the national uh, police officers of the year. I mean, he interacts with the community big time. We get more guys like that. And I, I think we will, we're on our way to, uh, to probably uh, some of the solution. And then I think the legislation, I, I think, you know, uh, we, we got to be active in the voting at the local level. It can't just start when you're talking about the state and the federal level. We've got to get involved. And that means we got to get out and vote. Coach, I'm glad you took that answer there because that was the next question. And Miles, I want to bring it back to you. When we talk about creating chains, elections and voting are a huge part of that. In New York City, the primary elections were June 22nd for offices such as the mayor, city comptroller, Manhattan district attorney. Um, all of those positions were on the ballot. How, what is your understanding? of the urgency in terms of getting involved in local elections because we saw this year that student athletes in many institutions gave their students the their student athletes the day off of practice so that they could go and participate in this process yeah i think it's uh, it's huge you know voting and getting out and voting for who's important to you i think that's a huge part in you know change and trying to get that that next level of of our society and just being normal but like voting, I, I actually didn't look at it voting. I was actually young. So this past time was my first time voting and my mom and my parents were just making a huge big deal out of it. You know, they thought it was the, my life depended on it. So um, they just taught me how like us going out and vote could be that missing number that we everybody needed. So keep telling your friends to spread the word and vote and make sure you're telling them to vote and make sure they're telling their friends like she just made it a big deal like as in to why i need to vote and why it's important for me to vote and it'll change will happen because and because my vote counted so you know I, that's what i <laughs> your vote absolutely counts and that is the bottom line of the conversation the big east and rise have done a lot of important work together regarding civic en engagement Please elaborate on some of that work and why it is so critical that the sports community take a leadership position on this issue, especially in the context of addressing the topics that we're discussing today. RISE has, for us has been a, just a tremendous partner in this space uh, in terms of promoting racial justice and civic engagement. And as a conference, we are um, just thrilled to be one of the only conferences that have, has a conference-wide partnership. And that means RISE goes into each one of our member institutions and works with the campuses directly uh, to address their needs. Uh, they do assessments and surveys and workshops with our coaches and student athletes. 
So they are really invested in um, helping each school meet their particular needs because everybody's needs might be different. Uh, most recently, as we were coming off the most uh, national election, uh, we had the opportunity to partner with RISE to do a series of uh, workshops on civic engagement and the importance of being uh, and volunteering. Uh, so that was a huge educational uh, platform that we had for our entire conference. And I think the student athletes and coaches really gleaned a tremendous amount and value from that participation. And so we look forward to the ongoing partnership with them in the next year and continuing to roll up our sleeves and find ways uh, to partner together uh, to advance uh, racial uh, justice conversations. Um, Additionally, when you the second part of that question is in terms of why is it so important for, for sports to be engaged in this level, as you know, uh, sports is a visible platform. It's a very visible platform. Athletes have a lot of voice. Uh, coaches have a tremendous amount of invoice, uh, voice and influence. And so when they are uh, invested in issues such as this, other people who follow them or admire them or are, are mentored by them pay attention. Uh, and so we want people in the sports community to use their platform to help us uh, push this agenda because it takes allies from every corner of the planet to get to where we need to be as a society. And sports uh, in, in itself brings people from different backgrounds together. So it's, uh, in my opinion, an innate place to start because you have so many people from different backgrounds, economic races that are coming together anyway for a common cause. And that's usually to win a game. Right, so it makes perfect sense in my mind uh, for sports to take a leadership role in this in this space. I would say additionally that administrators have a tremendous uh, role to play as well. They need to lead boldly and um, have policies and accountability measures for their own staff uh, and their coaches to also be allies uh, in this space. So it, it takes a village, so to speak, uh, to move the needle. And I think sports is a perfect place to start. Uh, and I know there's a lot of athletes out there that are doing tremendous work in this space and coaches as well. And so for me, it's not enough to put out eloquent statements about how wrong uh, discri discrimination and racism is. It means action. We have to take action. And that means rolling up our sleeves, diving in the deep, overcoming the fears, being courageous, being brave to do the right thing at the right time. Uh, so it's no longer this passive um, system of, oh, you know, that's too bad, but it's okay, it's too bad that I'm gonna do something about it. Thank you, Tracy. We are past the time of passiveness for sure. Andrew, I wanna come back to you. The overarching question here is what comes next? We saw in 2020, a number of sports organizations, teams and individual players um, stepped up their activism in terms of really using their voice and their platforms. What more can the sports community do to lead in the area of issues of social justice or injustice, should we say, systemic racism and civic engagement moving forward? Yeah, great, great question. Um, and, you know, I wanna start by, by recognizing what athletes are doing, you know, athletes like Miles, who, who are using their platform, who are learning more, understanding more, um, bringing youth and law enforcement together, going out and meeting their local um, law enforcement officers, building those relationships, right? I think one of the things as we think about activism overall is that activism gets a bad rap. Activism is seen as this negative thing. It is seen only as protest. Um, but there, there are a wide range of activism and, and, and advocacy. And, and athletes and organizations have been involved in all of that. Tr Tracy just spoke about the education um, and programming that, that the Big East is doing and all of their schools have done. All of those things are action and activism is action that is supposed to push us forward. So civic engagement broadly, if we understand civic engagement as the ways in which we can use our resources to improve our communities, um, civic engagement broadly, I think is what sport organizations and, and all of us in the society um, should be committed to. Um, and obviously, you know, as Tracy mentioned before, you know, law enforcement is a huge part of our community. So what are the ways in which sport organizations are holding law enforcement accountable? Um, you know, Coach Anderson spoke about the transparency that is necessary. Um, I think that's absolutely important. One of the things that, that RISE has done as we've met with various law, law enforcement officials, sorry, across the country is have some conversation about what comes next um, and, and, and how do we 
train officers better? What are some of the conversations we can have? Um, and one of the things that's striking and that, that kind of came out is this discussion about what has been traditionally viewed as law enforcement um, and what is viewed more as community policing. Um, and so in, in, in our minds, one of the roles that the sports community can play in, in pushing this dialogue forward is beginning to educate not just their membership, but also their local law enforcement agencies about community policing and having more um, policing that, that has that philosophy or that mindset. Um, you heard Coach Anderson talk about PAT back when he was a, a, you know, a kid. Um, you know, Rice has done a lot of work with, with Detroit PAL, which is a, a police athletic league here. Um, and again, the, the mindset of those officers, their approach um, to the community, their approach to sports, um, I think is really powerful. So if we think about and recognize that sport can be a do for our society, um, officers play sport, the wider society plays sport, youth play sport, it, it's something that connects us. I think we really do need to see that human connection, um, see the humanity in one another, um, if we are to move our communities forward. And so sport organizations, I think to Tracy's point, are well poised and well equipped um, to raise the cry, to, to hold us accountable, all of us, um, so that we can do better. Um, not just, not just you know, citizens, um, but, but definitely law enforcement as we think about policies, practices, um, the education and the approach in general. I'm gonna ask each of you our final question. And I want you to think of your communities, the people that you impact, your platforms. And the answer may be simple. It may be a little bit more complex. How can others get involved? How would you encourage people in your circle um, to take the next step? What simple steps would you give someone in your community? Um, and Miles, let's start with you. Um, yeah, the steps that I would take, I mean, I would probably just do what I'm doing now and just being that leader for everybody and just making sure people know that they can do what I'm doing. Like it's not rocket science or it's not hard to do it. I mean, every every athlete that I've talked to, they got their own platform, uh, their own platform. So they have thousands of people they can reach out to with a single post. So all I say is, you know, do do what you want and use your platform. Like don't don't think your platform is too small for anybody or nobody's looking or nobody's going to see you because you know i i'm not no crazy person either i'm not i don't have 10,000 100,000 followers on instagram so i just try to do my best and doing my part and using my platform and what i have to reach out to my my um the people that follow me so that's what i would tell the people that's trying to you know love that tracy how would you encourage those in your circle and in your community to move from passive to active in this conversation yeah, I think uh, a couple things here. Um, continuing the dialogue is very important, uh, but there's also sometimes this fatigue that comes from just talking about the issues. So I do think there is this notion of, okay, from once the talking is stopped, then what are you going to do to improve the situation? And I think everybody um, is beholden, you know, of them to just say, what can I do personally to make a difference? And if you just ask yourself that question, you know, and it could be something very simple as to organizing, you know, a block party to, you know, go, you taking, you know, um, having a lunch hour or setting up a brown bag session with your own community police um, office. Um, there's so many like gra uh, grassroots things that can be done to move the needle uh, in this space. And so I think if people really take ownership again and, and look inward, what can I do to make a difference? That's the, the first place to start. And I think just really also making yourself knowledgeable and educating yourself on what your community issues are, uh, knowing what the issues are, knowing who your leaders are, knowing uh, what the issues are in your community and voting for the leaders who you think are gonna represent you best uh, in your area. So it starts from you know, educating yourself and really reflecting and saying, what can I do personally to move the needle in this space? These are all great steps that one can take, Miles and Tracy. Andrew, how would you encourage one to take steps? Yeah, you know, great, great responses. I think for us at RISE, it is about education and empowerment broadly, um, you know, understanding, you know, why you need to, to vote in local elections, why you need to be civically engaged in a community. You know, as Tracy said, you know, you need to understand the issues in your community, but I do think understanding 
who are the elected officials, how the AG, how the, the, the judges, how the you know DA, how they affect and impact policy um, in your community is important, especially as it relates to policing. Um, and then I, I do think it's that empowerment piece as well. One, it's empowerment of the next generation and your circles of influence. So you know, talk to your colleagues, talk to your friends, talk to your teammates, make sure that they understand um, their role um, in their communities as well. But, but, but secondly, you know, getting yourself to a point where you can take action. I think far too many of us uh, don't think we have the power and the ability to make a difference and to make a change, whether that be going and casting a ballot um, or whether that be, you know, reaching out and visiting a, you know, a local law enforcement or going and playing games on the block or having a block party. As Tracy said, these are all simple steps that we all need to feel empowered to do um, in our responsibility for our community. So it is about education. For us, it's also about empowerment and, and a belief that, that we can make a difference if we all work together. The belief is so very important. You'll never be compelled to take action if you don't have the belief. Coach Anderson, take us home. How would you encourage those in your circle to get involved actively in this solution? I'll tell you what, with, with all the panelists, what they just talked about, the education, the empowerment, uh, you know, I'm just sitting here listening to that and I'm thinking in my mind, you know, uh, what can I do, what can I do? You know, obviously when you talk about the next generation, the kids that are on our, let's say on our team, and, uh, and how about putting something together where I'm taking those guys out in the community with some of the police officers and they out there engaging with, you know, with the communities, because we are a part of this community all over the city of New York. Uh, I think that'll be something that uh, then all, obviously now, you know, those young kids that, are, that they see, look up to these players, uh, maybe now they can get over the little phobia about, you know, all cops are bad, you know, because that's the mindset. And, you know, the cat's out of the bag. But what has taken place in the last year and a half, I mean, is out there. The conversations are coming. They're talking about it. And they're saying, what can we do? And so now it's an opportunity. I think it's an opportunity for us to continue to push this thing. And, 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 I, and I love what Tracy said. Uh, you, know, you know, even as a coach, you know, there's some coaches, you know, that in the position, they put words out. Let's put actions behind it. And, and I think you know, just having this conversation here uh, with all the panelists and all the discussion, uh, I think it has kind of even re-engaged me even more as I move forward. So uh, I think the education part of it is going to be important, but uh, let's get out into our communities, the various communities, and and use that platform we have. We have a powerful platform. And so uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting engaged, and uh, uh, this has been great. Yeah. Thank you all. These were all great tidbits, all great advice. Um, in terms of Tracy's point about fatigue and to what Coach Anderson just said in terms of being re-engaged, stay in the conversation. And, and I, I know personally, in the moments where you feel weary, it is so helpful to think of those that are coming behind us and those that stand alongside us to help us find that energy that Coach Anderson just talked about. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Miles. Thank you, Coach Anderson. Thank you, Dr. McIntosh, for your insights. And thank you to our audience for joining us for Rises Beyond Justice Critical Conversation on Sport, Race, and Community Police Relations from New York City. I encourage everyone to take what you learned today, get involved, move from passive to active, and keep educating yourself so that you can be a champion of change in your community. Visit risetowin.org to learn more. You all, thank you again for your time. Thank you for your honesty and sharing your experiences and creating this space. I applaud all the work that you are doing and continue to do. Thank you for spending time with me again. I'm Monica McNutt. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Thank you.